Hello everyone, welcome to another Artist Loft uh, drawing class. I'm your instructor, Adrian Hodge, and I'm really excited about tonight's class. It's for all ages, and it is on illustrating or creating your own illustrated uh, fruit or vegetable inspired character. I think I got that title right. It was quite a mouthful. Um, so yeah, this is a two part class in tonight's class, we will be uh, developing the concept for our character, which I've, I've made super easy because I uh, included a reference photo in the supply list. Um, but there is the option to use your, your own uniquely inspiring piece of fruit or vegetable, which I, I hope you guys will do, because um, I'd love to see a lot of different examples from this class, but uh, tonight we'll be talking about the, the concept, creating a concept for a character, and then uh, sketching the character, and then doing our uh, prepping for our final illustration, which we'll, we'll do next week. So um, I'll go ahead and switch over to my tabletop view here and go over the supplies. So we've got, Oh, but first, there's a couple of my business cards if you're interested in checking out some of my work um, and where you can find me online uh, besides Instagram. Uh, there's my website and Facebook. I'm Adrian Hodge Fine Art, and I even got on TikTok recently at Adrian Hodge Art. Um, don't have much up there yet, but plan to keep adding to it. Um, but yeah, don't forget to tag your work with the hashtags make it with Michaels or Michaels classes. And since there are so many things with those hashtags, sometimes uh, things from this class can get a little buried and it's hard for me to find and I'd love to see your work. So uh, if you tag me, um, even in just like a comment under your work from whatever you create tonight, then I'll be sure to see it. Adrian, um, so uh, all of Sorry, yes. before you go on, um, we have yeah. someone asking if you could uh, put up the business card again because um, it was a little blurry, a little further up, maybe. Okay, is that any better? Um, There's a little bit of a glare. There's um, a little sorry, my web, it's all Adrian Hodge, honestly. It's my website is adrianhodge.com. Um, it's my email is adrianhodge at gmail. Instagram, uh, I'm at Adrian Hodge Art, and Facebook, it's Adrian Hodge Fine Art. So uh, I'll link them just... to your um, link tree. How's that? Yeah, you could drop my link tree in the, the chat as well, and then you can find everything that way. Um, so, all of these classes, we use uh, Artist Loft uh, supplies. We're going to be using the Artist Loft version um, of these alcohol based markers. Um, mostly next week, we're probably not going to do too much with them tonight um, but uh, you'll want a set of those you definitely will have a hard time achieving the results in uh, similar to mine if you're using any other type of um, of marker so go try it because they the way that these blend is is really fun and lovely so i'm going to set those off to the side we're probably not going to get to those until uh, next week's class in part two um, you're going to want some sketching pencils, um, probably your lightest pencils, like an H or an HB or a 2H. Um, I might be using a heavier pencil tonight just so that you can see my lines, because sometimes when I sketch a little too lightly with the H pencils, they just don't show up on screen. So. Um, I know a lot of people sometimes want to use the exact pencil that I'm using. I recommend that you use an H pencil so that you can draw very lightly. Um, so the H pencils stand for hard and that uh, graphite inside of the pencil is going to be much lighter for all your uh, lighter values and for sketching. The B pencils stand for black and those are going to give you all of your uh, darker values. Um, but uh, I'm going to be sketching with a B pencil just so you can see my lines, but I want you to use an H pencil, but I'll repeat that when we get there anyway. Um, and then the second part of our, our sketch prep tonight, we're going to be using uh, some colored pencils. So I asked you to ask you to have a set of, yes, a 2H will work, any H pencil, a 2H, a 4H, and I'll, I'll repeat that when we start 
actually sketching in just a minute. Um, I, I kind of derailed myself a little bit there. Just, you know, since this class is for all ages, I do have a class that you can refer back to on uh, intro to graphite and drawing forms. Um, you can easily find that on YouTube or maybe Jimena could drop that in the chat. But if you're watching this later on YouTube, it's really easy to find that, that class under uh, these artist loft, this artist loft series. Um, Okay, so the next thing on the supply list, I asked you to get um, colored pencils because we're going to be using either the blue or the red colored pencil to do our um, our like groundwork for the final illustration. And that is because when you draw with the blue or the red pencil, it's much easier to go over it with the marker and markers and have your lines disappear and not be visible and it's easier to erase and it's just ideal for illustrations and then you're going to want uh, a synthetic eraser and uh, watercolor paper was recommended but you you could use um, mixed media paper or um, drawing paper but the watercolor paper is best just um, because of how it absorbs uh, the markers and just a, a thicker quality paper. So I recommend that. And then the uh, fruit or the vegetable. So hopefully you have your own, like I said, but if you don't and you want to just follow along with me and use my example, it was uh, this image was included in the supply list. So you could print it out yourself and draw from this one. Um, but before we get rolling with sketching this and moving on, I'm just curious uh, who in the, the audience does have, oh, and I see somebody asking about Bristol paper. Bristol paper would also be ideal. Um, yes. Um, but does anybody have a cool piece of fruit or vegetable that they're using that they would like to hold up and show us so we can see your your inspiring vegetables or fruit. I see James and Barbara holding up a cool looking pear there and I see a James has a I think it's a green bell pepper. It's kind of small or maybe a, a big jalapeno. I can't tell. Amena, can we spotlight some people and their their cool fruits and vegetables? Yeah, sure. Um, whoever wants me to spotlight, you just hold up your fruit and I will get to you. So here we go with Barbara. There we go. Okay, very cool. Yes, I um, love we it. We have Allie here as well. Oh my gosh, that already looks like I have so many ideas. I love it. That's perfect. And I think that's it for now. Oh, we have like oh, okay. I there I we saw go. A couple. Bell pepper. Oh, yeah, there's bell pepper. Okay, cool. Oh, yes, that one definitely has. All right. So yeah, I'm glad you're you're holding up yours and I can see just, you know, I can see the character already coming out of that one. Well, so I had this sweet potato sitting on my counter for a while and it started growing, you know, a little sprout there. And I just left it and left it until finally it was like, all right, it's time to compost that. It has not it's not probably going to get eaten at this point um but i had a little photo shoot with it i actually had several other photos that i probably could have printed out just to draw it from a different angle but uh from this angle it really looked like a narwhal to me it even has like a little eye there um you know this looks like cute little butt maybe i don't know and then yeah this felt like you know a, a unicorn horn like a narwhal um is it called a tusk or a horn? Anyway, um, giving away my lack of normal knowledge at the moment. But anyway, so yeah, just looking at this, I was immediately inspired and saw a character in it. But there, there's so many things that we could do with, with this besides what I did, which was kind of just draw it like it is. And I loved that potato that um, I think it was Ali held up because you could already see a face in it or the bell pepper kind of had what felt like maybe some legs coming together at the end um, and the the pear just had such a interesting gesture to it as well so um so first thing we're going to do is we're just going to draw our, our sweet potato or our, our piece of fruit whatever it is so i'm going to 
grab some sketching paper here and my pencils. So this is going to be a pretty low key class tonight because we're just going to be sketching and drawing and maybe adding some things to it and seeing, you know, how we can turn it into a character and I'm going to go step by step into just rendering the piece of fruit. So we're kind of starting out like a still life. Um, we're just going to draw it. So use whatever um, pencil you prefer i recommend an h like i said i'm going to use a 4b just because i want you to be able to see my lines and it is a little tricky for me to get my um my photograph on the in the screen at the same time so i'm going to just keep it off screen because that's the easiest um i saw somebody said can you use charcoal yes you can use whatever you want for the sketching phase so First thing we're going to do is just sketch the overall outline of the form. We're not going to worry too much about, I'm always talking about implied line and all of these classes. Um, here is where I don't mind if you, you know, I want you to draw lightly if you can, but we're just fleshing it out right now. We're seeing what maybe we can add to it, what parts of it, you know, are begging for some personification, like what part of it looks like a face or a body part or an animal or an animal's body part, or it looks like it needs maybe a piece of clothing right there, or you could turn part of it into clothing. We're just going to examine all those things. But first, we've just got the outer line or, or the shape of it. And then it wouldn't be a class with me if I didn't talk about following the contour lines and looking for the value shapes. And every single one of these drawing classes, I talk about this because it's one of the most essential things to rendering something in three dimensions. And we maybe might not end up with a lot of these uh, value shapes showing light and dark or contour lines showing the elevation of the, um, the three dimensional form. We may not end up with a lot of those in our, our final illustration. Um, but when we add the, the colors, we want to make sure that we're following those contour lines. So we're just going to map them out for ourselves. So um, in that class on introduction to graphite and um, drawing forms, I wrapped a piece of yarn around a piece of fruit and illustrated how it was rounded and it was curved and how that curved line tells you, you know, that it, that it's three dimensional and it's every direction of the object is going to have some sort of contour line. So if we're looking at it vertically, the up and down right now, it's curved like this. And then if we look at the horizontal shape of the, the sweet potato, we've got a line that curves like this. So look at your fruit. So from those examples that I saw, um, like the bell pepper, for instance, most of it is going to follow something like this. It's going to be pretty, but then down there on those legs, you're going to have, you know, a couple of cylinders. I'm already calling them legs at the, the bottom of the bell pepper where it, it was looking like some legs. But then if you've got, yeah, anything that kind of deviates from the, the rest of the the form, it's a little bit different than the rest of the form. Then notice how like over here on the, the back side of it, it's like a little torpedo shape like this. So the contours on this part are following a much different path. So we're just noticing. Notice any, <clears throat> excuse me, unusual dips and curves that may be happening, any imperfections. We're just 
getting a feel for the, the overall three-dimensional shape and form of the object. Okay, then we're gonna look for any little moments that are different or might be referred to as imperfections, but these could become character traits, right? Just like with anyone in life, our imperfections are usually the things about us that make us who we are and give us our, our character traits. So what could these be? Um, I didn't focus on these a whole lot in my final illustration, but as we're looking at these, maybe, you know, they could be like, I was sort of seeing another face on this side of the sweet potato right here. Like maybe it could be, you know, a creature that has, you know, three heads, like a Cerebus narwhal uh, sweet potato, Cerebus, three-headed creature. Um, I don't know. I would love for, if you're using my reference photo for yours to be a little bit different than mine, so maybe when you're looking at those, those little spots, you could turn those into faces. If you want to. Uh, the other thing that I didn't do with my, my final example here, or my first example was, I didn't put any clothing on it, but I really thought maybe it could use a scarf like a striped scarf of some color might be kind of nice or a little hat or um, now would be a good time to show you guys how when I did my initial sketch of this, I printed it out for my daughter because she really wanted to draw on top of it. And so my daughter is eight and I, so I printed out just my pencil sketch of it um, and she turned it into an actual Gave it a little unicorn horn there and she gave it a little fin and like her little rosy cheek so she did a few different things to it than i did um but yeah now is the time to sketch out all of those ideas if you're thinking about giving it uh, an article of clothing or anything like that i recommend looking at a picture of like the type of hat that you're thinking of putting on it. If you're thinking of giving it like a, a top hat or a newsboy cap or, you know, whatever, look at a picture of a hat like that, just so that, you know, since you're spending all this time on your uh, character drawing, you don't, and you're, we're looking at the piece of fruit, then it would be nice to make sure that what you're adding to it feels, you know, as, developed as the um, as the drawing itself. And since I didn't print out a picture of a hat, I'm looking around my studio to see what I could add to this. Because um, I don't even want to draw a hat from my imagination. I feel like it'll look kind of sad. Um, on it. I'm going to come back to it. Okay. Um, but I'm just drawing it like it looks. So I'm putting a little sprout in here now. So I've drawn kind of a cylinder shape or a tree trunk here. And I drew a couple of the little uh, knobby moments, little new growth that's coming off like little leaves. And then as you do that, if it's looking kind of flat and not three dimensional, then you can do a curved line all the way up the little trunk of the sprout so that you make it feel more three, dimen three dimensional. And then you can add some vertical straight lines just to help you understand what the contours are doing. And you can do that even on the, the smaller parts of it as well. So whatever you can do to just give it weight. At this point, you're just 
getting a good understanding of the the weight of the the fruit or vegetable. And then now I'm looking at some of these little fuzzy moments that are happening throughout the sweet potato that give it some texture. And this is where, you know, you could start to see maybe a fin or another type of characteristic that you might have on an animal. So what else could it be here? I'm just throwing out lots of ideas. Do you guys have any cool ideas that you'd like to share with me in the chat about what else we could add to this sweet potato to make it a different sort of character? My daughter added the little fin, a beard. Oh, I love that or a little mustache would be great. Arms would be great. A tail. Oh, a bow tie. Oh, I love that. Hairy legs. Oh, you guys have great ideas. Okay, cool. So I like the bow tie idea, but I feel like since he's facing away from me, I would only see part of the bow tie. Maybe something like that. Hmm. I don't know what I think about that. You should put a bow tie on yours though, and then let me see what it looks like. I might just leave mine kind of simple and let y'all y'all do all these ideas. Okay, so when it comes to adding um, like facial features on over to the side, because we're just in like our concept uh you know development phase right now so maybe you could sketch out some of the ideas that you have like like a bow tie just so that you don't forget later you can look up a picture of a nice bow tie or a, a mustache a cool handlebar mustache it's not very symmetrical anyway and then, yeah, when it comes to the eyes and the mouth or um, any facial features that you want to add to your character, draw a few different ones off to the side. So, you know, if you go ahead and put them on your, your character right away, you might decide you don't like it. So draw them off to the side and just kind of envision them there. So I'm just going to draw a few different cartoonish looking eyeballs. So I did a little circle with another circle inside and then another little circle. So it's got a sparkle. And then I gave it three eyelashes. So maybe that's what I ended up doing to the, I just did two little eyelashes and I didn't even give it a sparkle in the eye, um, but maybe something like that, or maybe you want it to have really big dopey eyes and depending on where you put the little circles within it is going to change which direction it appears that your character is looking so putting a couple of circles like a sparkle inside of it can give you you know some different facial expressions definitely gives it a little more emotion makes it feels makes it feel a little more emotive when you put those sparkles in or the eyelashes or you could do something that's a little more human looking so i just did a curved line on top and then a few eyelashes coming out from underneath that. We kind of made a little fish shape overall. I'm trying to make it look a little more cartoonish, but still more human. So yeah, try out a few different eyes. Um, and same thing with the lips. Um, and I was definitely very inspired by my daughter and the way she draws a lot of her little uh, cartoonish characters all the time. I love how she gives everything 
big dopey eyes and then she just will put like a tiny little mouth on there so you know you could do something that's like some big big lips so do a little two hills with a line underneath it for the top lip you'll never hear me advise you to draw lips like this again and then do a big loop underneath something like that make it a little more human you know these little like a little smile like this so it'll have big dopey eyes and then just a little smile or a little nose like that so play around with with those facial features and you could probably find a lot more examples of cartoonish facial features to to look up um, if you googled you know just cartoon eyes or cartoon noses or cartoon uh, mouths you could find you know just a whole bank i'm sure of some different kinds of of eyes nose and, and mouth like that okay so just to review before we get started laying down our um, our sketch in the blue or red uh, colored pencil to prepare for adding color to this. Um, we've just sketched our our piece of fruit or vegetable. We found how to make it feel three dimensional by illustrating all of the contour lines, which are the elevational curves that show us you know, the path that a string would take if you wrapped it around that piece of fruit or vegetable. And then we outlined some of the dark and light shapes. I guess I didn't quite finish doing that. I started to. There's um, definitely a big shadow across the whole bottom of my sweet potato in this, this photograph. And then we've got the big shadow that's being cast across the table but if you were going to put this this narwhal sweet potato in the water then you maybe wouldn't see that shadow so you might have water coming up to like here and then going you know straight across it or maybe like he's kind of coming out of the water a little bit or you're seeing through the water. That would be fun. So think about what environment you might put him in. If he's going to have an environment, he or she or they or where, uh, you know, where you want to put them. I'm just going to keep mine uh, simple because I'm trying to stick to the, the techniques here, but you could just go in so many different directions with this. Um, so I just really wanted to get you thinking in terms of character construction. So any questions about this stage before I move on? I saw in the chat people were asking about uh, the the colored pencils. So it sounds like we're, we're ready to start sketching our our final one on the watercolor paper. Yes, we are. That's the only question so far. Okay, cool. All right. Well, let me put all this away and I'm going to uh, switch my watercolor paper pad to a clean sheet here. Um, oh, before I move on, I did recommend getting the, the big watercolor pad. I'm using the, um, what size is this? I think it's 12 by 16 um and that was because this class was marketed for all ages and one of the things that you know i've taught uh, middle school i'm just gonna rip this off because it's easier than moving my document camera to flip it um one of the things that i've encountered over the years when i've taught uh younger kids and um I mean, I see it in adults too, but I see it most often in kids. And that is drawing very small. Um, in fact, it's such an issue with elementary and middle school students 
that often points are given in an art class for those age groups just for filling the page because there's such a tendency to make it really tiny on on the page and just not fill the page and I like to think a lot about the psychology behind why we do the things that we do and why it is that um, that students would do that in an art class and I think it's because um, well, it's a couple different things, but mostly, and especially when I see adults doing it, I think it's because we're afraid of our skills. We're afraid they're not very good. And so we're trying to kind of hide the drawing. Like if we make it smaller, then people won't see what's wrong with it necessarily, or what we deem is wrong with it. Um, but actually when you use a bigger piece of paper and you force yourself to try to fill more of the page on a, a larger sheet of paper, you're actually giving yourself a lot more um, room to, you know, to improve and a lot more, it makes it easier. It feels counterintuitive. It feels like drawing it bigger would make it harder, but I'm here to tell after all my years of experience, drawing it bigger makes it easier, just point blank, like it's full stop, you know, drawing bigger will make it easier because you're giving yourself more room. There's more room to explore this particular area. And um, especially with small hands, you know, your dexterity, the ability to move your hand in a wide range might be, um, you know, not like your ability to put a small detail in might, you know, be a little more challenging for you. So if you draw it bigger, then you have more room to draw that, that tiny detail. Like just going back to my daughter's example here, um, since this was on a larger piece of paper, she was able to draw that tiny little face. But like if she had done this on a much smaller scale and then she tried to add that little smile, it might have made it really tricky to get in there and make that little line. You see what I mean? So draw bigger, guys. That's all I'm trying to say. I could, you know, keep going on and on. But my whole point behind that is I recommended the bigger piece of paper because I wanted small hands to practice drawing bigger. Um, well, you'll be amazing. Whenever you can, can you um, show the reference photo just one more time? Yes. There we go. Thank you. Move it up so you can see the shadow. And then that sprout goes all the way up there. Oh, there's so many fun things you could do with this sprout too. You could like, you know, we just passed the holidays, but you could turn it into a Christmas tree, have little ornaments hanging off of it. It could have like lights that are going across like a yard or something. The possibilities are endless. I really hope people will share their final products with me because I'm excited to see what you guys do with blue. And then the other option would be red. Normally it's red or blue is what you see a lot of illustrators using. Um, and both of them are really great at what we're doing with them, uh, being able to disappear on the, the page and, and cover it up. I mean, if I had done this in pencil, you might see some of my pencil lines peeking through, especially like with the lighter areas. But whenever I do this with blue, um, it just, it disappears. It's kind of magical how it's just gonna disappear on that marker under, or, yeah, under the marker. And you're not gonna have to do much to erase lines. And also uh, because it's a little more waxy, um, it's gonna kind of sit on top of the page and uh, on the watercolor paper, especially since it's so absorbent. Um, with a pencil, your lines might get kind of ingrained into the paper and be harder to erase. But with the blue colored pencil um, or the red, it should be easy to erase as we go. So I'm just going to start drawing my sweet potato friend again here. And I'm trying to be pretty light with my lines again, but I do want to focus on the, the parts 
or be a little lighter in the areas where, you know, like by the face, because I wanted my line right there to kind of disappear and be a little more implied so that the nose stuck out, but then the mouth kind of like I didn't draw a mouth at all, but you still feel like the mouth is there because of the, the gap that I left. And I did the same thing um, when I was sketching it, but then I covered up my sketch, but I took photographs of every stage of that, that illustration. And you can see them on my Instagram if you go check out my last post about this upcoming class or about this class. I put all of my like, stages of the illustration uh, photographs in there. All right, so I've just got the, the overall shape down here. I'm getting a little wonky on this side, so I'm going to fix it. But yeah, if you press down super hard with this pencil, it is going to, you know, be challenging to erase. But if you draw lightly, it should sit nicely on top of the watercolor paper. Okay, I don't know why I'm drawing the backside so differently this time. All right, and then I'm not changing a whole lot from the reference photo. Honestly, I'm just emphasizing or leaving space where I want to emphasize later. So like by the mouth, I'm leaving it really blank because I want the colors that I add there to make the mouth come to life. And I drew this kind of high up on my page. I didn't leave a whole lot of room for the sprout. So maybe I'll do something different with the sprout. Maybe I'll make the sprout kind of curl and be more like a vine. That could be fun. Oh, and then I could put like a little light at the end of it. Oh, I like that idea. Okay, that'll be how I, I change this one. I'm making it into a little bit of a curly cue sprout. So this entire exercise tonight was definitely inspired by the fact that I am in the middle of illustrating a children's book right now, which is very exciting. Um, a friend of mine wrote a children's book and asked me to illustrate it in my style, but along the way I've had to adjust my process because I found that drawing in pencil isn't really helpful to me when I go to add, I'm using liquid inks to add the color um, because that's what a lot of my personal work I use, liquid inks, calligraphy inks specifically. Um, but the character in the, the story, the main character is very light. Um, I'm being really vague. I'm not telling you what the character is, but um, it's very light. So it's pretty impossible for me to draw it in pencil and be satisfied as I'm going along in the process. So I started investigating different illustration techniques and I found, oh, that I see so many illustrators using the blue or red pencils. I honestly, I did not know what the advantages and disadvantages of it was, uh, were until very recently when I started running into so many issues with my own illustrations. So, and I know there's so many different ways to, you know, digitize illustrations now, you know, using programs like Procreate and things like that. So, but it's still good to know the old fashioned way to do things. I tend to be a very analog person. So anyway, okay, so I'm just putting in a few little moments here. Taking my time. We've got plenty of time in the class next week to add all of our our colors. Probably 
uh, as far as we'll get tonight is I'll just start to test some of uh, the colors that we'll need to blend and mix together to get this lovely variation that's happening here and just tell you how I did this. Um, but you don't necessarily have to follow my example of blending and matching all of the colors on the sweet potato. For one, you may have, you know, entirely different colors on your, your vegetable or fruit, um, but you might decide you want to do something more like what my daughter did and just leave it, um, you know, sort of more graphic, you know, just use it two or three colors. I think she only used three different colors here. She used the light pink or like the flesh tone color. And then the, um, well here, I can tell you exactly which one she used by looking at the, the set that I have. Um, so she used the peony pink. And I remember I was using the powder flesh color and then the lavender and the canary yellow and then the black. So, you know, you can keep it sort of solid like that as well. You don't have to blend with all the colors like I'm going to be doing, but it definitely is fun to blend with these alcohol-based markers because they can. So I'm going to show you all the things that we, we can do with them and then you decide, you know, and draw it a few different times, especially if you've got this big watercolor paper like I recommended in the uh, supply list, then you know, you've got plenty of space to play around with and draw it a few different times and add the color a few different ways. And So Adrian, would you add the ac um, accessories right now or wait till the end? Yeah, I would go ahead and add them now for sure. If you've decided what you want to add, like, let me go ahead. I really want to put a little light bulb on this. I feel like that would be really fun. I'm looking at the light bulb in my lamp. I don't know about y'all, but I have a hard time drawing things purely from my imagination, unless I've been drawing them a really long time, like clouds and all, all the things that you see in my artwork are things that I can draw without looking at them. I can draw clouds all day long without looking at them and landscapey things. But when it comes to pretty much everything else, I need a reference. Okay, so there's my little light. Oh yeah, that'll be fun because I can even do maybe some glowing around it. So I am gonna probably want some sort of background color here if I'm gonna make this glow. Maybe I'll put a cloud, clouds. Um, if you're interested in drawing drawing and painting clouds. I have a class up right now in my, you can find it through my link tree in my online shop. Um, it's a independent class, not through Michael's, but it's called Drawing and Painting Clouds. And I'll be teaching that at the end of the month on Zoom, if you're interested. And there's a whole lot of fun premium class coming premium classes coming up with uh, this Michael series um, that cover uh, facial so and different parts of portrait drawing. So I know we only recently covered portrait drawing for the first time in this series and a couple of the classes were premium. There's going to be a lot more premium classes on like drawing eyes, the one at the end of January in uh, this Michael series is on drawing eyes. And then, um, yeah, drawing lips and hair and, and all that is, is coming up later. So keep an eye on the, the calendar. Those premium classes are very affordable. I'm just moving my camera a little bit so you can see the, the bottom of my creature here. I guess I'll just stick with the shadow, although I was kind of thinking about, maybe I will put them in the water. 
if anybody has any questions, I didn't do it about how I did the shadow on this one. It was pretty simple, so I can you know, definitely circle back to that next week, but I think I'm going to put this one in the water. Just going to kind of put some water, a water line in front and kind of bounce in there, but we can still see using a bunch of horizontal lines to make it look like water and make it them kind of wavy. All right, that's different. Okay, so any questions about this preliminary sketch in blue or red or anything at this point before I start mixing and matching colors? No, so far we're good. Um, you're asking about uh, the time for uh, part two. Uh, I'm trying to look that class up, so I'll put the link in the in the chat as soon as I find it. Okay, yeah, it's the same um, same time uh, as this one next week. So, oh, there you go. Okay, let's save actually illustrating our character for next week. Um, I just want to talk about blending these alcohol based markers and uh, color mixing and matching here and show you how to blend. So um, these come with two uh, sides, they're dual tip markers. Um, also got the the primary set here. Open that, pull those out too. See if I have any colors in here that I don't have in the other one. It comes with poppy red, but then the the twenty four piece set. The red is a crimson, so it's a little different but it's the canary yellow. There's a green in the primary set. That's a little different. That green is a mantis green. And then they've got such lovely names. Sea foam, that'll be fun for the, the actual sea foam. So Adrian, we do have a question here um, okay. from Laura. How much detail should we have in our drawing? Um, you can put as much detail as you want. That's the lovely thing about the, the blue pencil is that it will, you know, as long as you're not pressing super hard into the page, um, it'll be pretty easy to erase or it will disappear. So if you're, you know, like me in that moment right there where I know that I wanted it to be um, implied, I didn't, you know, wanted the mouse to not be there. I wanted to put the colors like I did here. Um, I know for a fact I did not have to erase the blue pencil very much on this drawing. Like there might have been a few straggler lines sticking out, but for the most part, every blue line that I drew was covered up by the, the alcohol based markers. So, um, like I said, if you go to my Instagram, you can see all of my sketch that's like underneath here. You can see my blue sketch, and it was pretty similar to this. It didn't have a ton of detail, but um, but it's all underneath there. You don't have to erase it. So put as much as you want. Just don't press down super hard because you know it might. If you're putting a lighter color there, it might peek through. But for the most part, it's going to disappear, which is why it's such a great technique and why I've started using it in my illustrations for the the book that I'm illustrating because I needed the lines to disappear because I was struggling with my pencil line still being visible even under when I haven't encountered that so much before in the past. Um, you can find it's at Adrian Hodge art. So in the post that I made about this class tonight, I included all of my step by step. Like I included my sketch of the um, Which I should have the sketch somewhere I keep just showing my daughters drawing over the, the printout, but the pencil sketch is in, included in that post and then the blue one, which is underneath the, the illustration. Okay, any other questions like that? 
Yes, um, we have a question about um, the markers. So is there a reason for, for us using alcohol-based markers? Um, like what happens if someone doesn't have alcohol-based markers? Would that still be okay? Um, they're just not going to do the same fun stuff that these will, and that is the way that they blend. I don't know of any other markers really that um, that blend like this, that you can layer them and, and do this, this illustration technique with. If you know of markers that, that do that, then please share. Um, but the alcohol-based markers have this very watery um, sort of, I mean, watercolor markers, you could add water and bleed them and, and make them actually bleed. Um, and I, I plan to do a class with the, the watercolor markers later on in this series. Um, but, but yeah, they just have a certain, um, the colors, there's such a wide range of colors. So there's a lot of different opportunities for, for blending them. They're really great for uh, flesh colored things like this uh, sweet potato or, you know, um, portraits. So so yeah, there's a lot of advantages to these alcohol-based markers. And I plan to do another class with them as well because they're just so fun. I, I definitely wanted to use them again, but they're they're pretty, pretty cool. I definitely recommend getting them if you're using just, you know, any any other markers, you're probably gonna find they're not going to do what these are doing. Um, and the other thing is they come with a blender. So, you know, every set will have one that's labeled blender in it. Um, maybe not every set, the primary set didn't come with the blender. Um, but you want that blender, the 24 piece set is the one I believe I had on the, the supply list for tonight. Okay, so they're, they're dual tip markers and they've got a side that is like a paintbrush and then they have a side that is a chisel side. So, um, and you can use them both. I definitely prefer the, uh, the brush tip side. So um, with any new, I'm just gonna draw in the margins underneath my illustration here just to start to, um, test out the markers and, and talk about them. Um, with any new material that you've never used before, when you get a new marker or pen or paintbrush or, or anything like that, you want to just, well, I like to do this, just see what all the different lines that I can make with them. So turn it on its side and make a long line with, with the brush tip like that and then turn it the other way and see how thin of a line you can make just to help with like your control over it. Um, and then same thing with the chisel side. I'm not a huge fan of, I mean, it's fine, but I find myself using the, the brush tip a lot more than, than the chisel side, but same thing. You can get a thicker line if you turn it on its side. And then if you use just the point or the edge, you can get a, a thinner line as well. And then take a few different colors, like all of, if you have this 24 piece set, um, then it comes with several different flesh colors here. I've got pale pink, powder, praline, pearl, um, coffee. Another powder. Oh, it comes with two of those, hazelnut. Okay, so take those kind of colors and overlap them and just see how they look when you overlap them together. So that was the hazelnut on top of the powder. And then I'm gonna add the pale pink that and see how it blends in with the powder there. It blends very seamlessly and gives you a really nice sense of 
blending. Okay, and then this is the pearl, so same thing. So you can get a lot of color variation to happen in a way that feels really seamless. And that's what I mean by it's difficult to, uh, to get this with, with any other kind of marker. So this is the coral reef color. I'm just going to do that next to a couple of different pinks and reds and just see how those layer. So that, that was the, the crimson and the coral reef. And then this is the poppy red. So that one definitely pops, but it still blends really nicely with the other two. And then here is the pastel blue. And the Gulf blue. So where I'm overlapping them, it doesn't just kind of, it doesn't overtake the other color like another kind of marker might do. They, you can see how it affects the other colors. And then the I use the blender so you can put the blender down first or you can go on top of everything with the blender and it sort of makes it it makes that you know with a lot of different mediums if you if you overdo it with the blender it could start to um, well, here, let me just show you on the other illustration. I definitely had a, a moment where I think I over blended just a little bit too much there and it, it started to kind of feel like watercolor paper would if I added too much water and over blended. Oh my gosh, I just realized we ran right up to seven o'clock. Okay, so we are out of time for tonight's class. I was getting so into talking about the markers. So um, yeah, I just wanted to test them out a little bit and just talk about starting to to blend. I did touch on a few colors that I will be using on this one, but we've got plenty of time next week to um, to continue creating a little palette and adding to to mine and then to to yours as well. If you have any lingering questions, I'm gonna do a little Instagram live on my uh, my Instagram page right right now after the class here in just a couple of minutes. So if you want to join me and ask any specific questions about, you know, your color palette that you might use for yours, you can join me on uh, my Instagram page and just my Instagram to see the recording of the, the Instagram live um, from tonight. And then, yeah, next week we will create a palette for this illustration and then we'll, we'll add the color and we'll hopefully see a lot of different illustrations at the end of the class that everybody has created from this template. Um, thank you all for joining me and I'll see you in part two next week. Thank you so much, Adrian, And thank you so much everyone for joining us today. See you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye.